Hey biology students! This week we're going to talk about plants. I know this is the time in the semester when my students get so excited to come to class. Suddenly the students who normally don't participate in the class are raising their hands and asking tons of questions about plants. Everyone seems to be at the edge of their seats during these lectures on plants. Okay, so I was being sarcastic. In reality, this is usually um, a lecture series that my students don't always find the, to be the most exciting of the semester. Yet I don't really understand why. Guys, let's not bash the plants. There's some really cool plants out there. Do you know what plant? is shown on this slide. That's right, this is the Venus flytrap. And the Venus flytrap is a member of a group of plants that are rare carnivorous plants that actually are sticky and capture insects that they digest in addition to being photosynthetic. So why should we study plants? Well, there are lots of reasons why plants are important to humans. Oh yeah, we eat plants. So if you eat fruits and vegetables, which you should, by the way, <laughs> um, obviously we get those products from plants. If you eat meat, how do you think the animals survived before they ended up on your dinner plate. That's right, animals, chickens, cows, etc. also eat plants. We consider plants to be a primary producer. What that means is it's the bottom of the food chain. And so we either directly eat plants or we eat the animals that ate the plants. Oh yeah, you like to breathe, right? Well, thanks to the oxygen that's produced primarily by plants from photosynthesis, we get all of the oxygen we need to survive and perform cell respiration. Many plants also have health benefits, um, including various extracts from plants. So we get Aspirin actually comes from willow bark. We also get various herbal remedies and herbal teas and um, essential oils from plants. And so there's lots of health benefits that plants hold, a lot of medical uh, uh, secrets, and per perhaps even the cure to some illnesses that we have yet to to uncover could come from plants. We also know that plants, as a result of photosynthesis, capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And we know that global warming is caused by too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So plants have the potential to reverse global warming if they can remove enough of the carbon dioxide. And I know we've talked about before that many scientists are working to enhance the plant's natural ability to remove carbon dioxide by genetically engineering plants to overexpress the enzyme that they use to capture carbon dioxide. And then last, plants are just so pretty, aren't they? Don't you, everybody would love to get a bouquet of flowers that looks as beautiful as these roses on the slide. So there's a lot of aesthetic value to plants. And really they've evolved that way. They've evolved to be aesthetically pleasing and to smell sweet to attract pollinators. Now, not all of them smell so sweet, but they are designed to um, or have co-evolved with their pollinators 
to attract the animals and insects that will help them complete their life cycles. Let's talk about what does it mean to be a member of the kingdom plantae? So what are some characteristics that all plants have? Well, they're all multicellular eukaryotes. Remember, we are discussing a kingdom within the domain eukarya. All of the plants have internal chloroplasts. That is the organelle that allows them to perform photosynthesis. Therefore, we classify plants as photoautotrophs. We've used that term in the previous week's lectures in describing certain groups of photosynthetic protists. To be a plant, it means that you have adapted your life to live on land. So this involves having roots, stems, and leaves. Many plant groups have additional adaptations besides roots, stems, and leaves. These include pollen, seeds, flowers, and fruit. Please note that not all plants have these particular adaptations. So we will be discussing different groups of plants in this lecture and describing which groups have these particular adaptations and make sure you know which groups do and which groups do not. All plants have sex. They perform sexual reproduction. We call that process alternation of generations and we'll be learning that process. Now, some plants can also reproduce what we call asexually. So they do that by cloning themselves. And there are lots of examples of that in the plant kingdom. For example, when you see these little buds on the cactus plants, that is, that is actually an identical clone um, or offspring that's identical to the parent cactus. When you grow strawberries, strawberries will oftentimes produce what we call runners. So these are unique um, stems that then will reproduce an identical copy of our genetic clone of the original strawberry plant. The other example I gave you on the slide was succulents, things like uh, members of the jade family, okay, like aloe vera plant, for example. We have lots of these plants in San Diego County because they're very drought resistant. And one of the things you may not realize is that you can actually take a, a cut off of um, a jade plant, a leaf, doesn't have to be a seed, but you could take a leaf off of it and, and, and pot that in potting soil and it will regrow the entire plant. Um, through asexual reproduction, it will genetically reproduce the entire plant. So that's unique to certain groups of plants. Let's start by talking about the evolution of plants. We've seen this slide before. We saw this slide last week in the lectures, and this describes a very important process in the history of all eukaryotes. And this process is called endosymbiosis. So in the last week, we learned that all life on Earth originated from a single cell, a single cell that scientists believe was a prokaryote or a bacteria. And so eventually, bacterial cells um, branched into different groups of bacterial cells and then eventually into eukaryotic cells or more complex cells that have a nucleus and many complex membrane bound organelles. So recall there were two events in endosymbiosis. The first endosymbiosis, what we call primary endosymbiosis, involved a swallowing of aerobic bacteria that eventually would evolve into the mitochondria organelle. 
And then secondary endosymbiosis involved some of these early eukaryotic cells engulfing, or remember, swallowing up cyanobacteria. So cyanobacteria are indeed prokaryotes. Under the microscope, this is what they look like. And we know that the cyanobacterium, these evolve approximately two and a half billion years ago in oceans. And so we recognize this as the origin of photosynthesis on our planet. These are the first organisms on Earth to perform photosynthesis. Again, they evolved approximately two and a half billion years ago in oceans. And they were prokaryotes. We call them cyanobacteria. They are still around today, okay? The descendants of these original photosynthetic ancestors on Earth are still around today. We call them cyanobacteria. We know that some of these cyanobacteria were engulfed by early eukaryotic cells and evolved into what are now modern-day chloroplasts. This process is called secondary endosymbiosis, and we studied it in the endosymbiosis lecture video. And that was last week in lecture 17. So these ancestral eukaryotes would give rise to all of the photosynthetic eukaryotes on Earth. So this would mean we have the first ancestor of land plants. And so the ancestor of all land plants was an ancestral eukaryote that was green and was a member of the protist kingdom. Can you venture a guess who that might be? We've talked about it in lecture 17. So once again, we're thinking about an ancestral eukaryote who is a protist, who is photosynthetic. So a plant-like protist. Here it is. So this ancestral eukaryote would eventually evolve into the ancestor the common ancestor of all land plants. And this common ancestor is green algae. Okay, so now let's look at this in terms of a phylogenetic tree. So in lecture 17, we introduced the concept of phylogenetic trees. Remember, those are evolutionary relationships among organisms, including their ancestors. So this is again green algae. Now on the top of the screen, we're looking at green algae, which by the way is still around today. So the descendants of that original green algae still around today. And it's commonly referred to as pond scum. So you see it growing on the surface of ponds and it just looks like, you know, green goo on the top of a pond. Now, if we look at it microscopically, we would notice that it actually is multicellular. So this is green algae here. And so if we see it under the microscope, you take some of this green goo on the surface of a pond or, or lake and you look at it under the microscope, well, you're going to see that it's a multicellular algae. 
composed of many cells. You see that here? So there's all these little units that connect. That's because it's multicellular. So this is recognized as the common ancestor of all land plants. And the ancestor here lived approximately 800 million years ago. So we're talking about the common ancestor of all plants. So it's recognized as the green algae. The original green algae lived approximately 800 million years ago in oceans, okay, in water, water-based life. So if we think about a plant that evolves from the green algae because it's very closely related to algae, it's going to look a lot like algae, except this would be a plant that lives on land. So that is the characteristic of all plants, is that this is a multicellular eukaryotic photoautotroph, but lives on land. So can you think of a, a plant that's very, very small, that looks like pond scum, looks like green algae, but lives on land. Moss, good. So moss would be the ancestor um, or the next um, evolved organism from these green algae and the common ancestor of all um, land, land plants from here, moving on. So, these are a member of a group of plants we call bryophytes, and we'll learn about them in more detail in the next lecture video. But I would like you to know that the common ancestor of all land plants, so we're going to put this little dot on our phylogenetic tree showing that land plants evolve from green algae, and basically it's green algae that learn to live on land that developed enough of a root-like system that it could live on soil or on other surfaces, still very dependent on water, okay? So we'll learn that mosses are very dependent on water for their reproduction, but they have some adaptations that allow them survival on land. So it's recognized that the common ancestor of all land plants. So all land plants evolve approximately 475 million years ago. 475 million years ago. And so that, rec that introduces our first plant group that we'll study. And these are called the bryophytes. Notice that there's three types, mosses, hornworts, and liverworts. So we'll learn more about them in a next lecture video. Okay, branching, continuing in the family tree of plants, okay, the phylogenetic tree. The next trait to evolve is vascular tissue. We'll talk more about what that means, but the ability to transport water from roots to leaves and grow taller involves vascular tissue. And so the next group to evolve are the seedless vascular plants, which include ferns, horsetails, whisk ferns, and club mosses. Okay, following from that, 
we have the next group evolve, and now we have the very important trait of seeds. So seeds evolve, and that would be the gymnosperms. And gymnosperms, actually the name gymnosperm means naked seed. So these are our first seed producing plants. They include cycads, ginkgos, conifers, and netophytes. The fourth group of plants to evolve are the angiosperms. And so these are the most recent plants to evolve and also the most diverse. So the majority of plants that we see in nature are angiosperms. That's because these, these plants are highly successful. They develop flowers and fruits. But notice the way this phylogenetic tree works, the way you need to interpret this tree. Remember, this is showing us time. So we're moving we're moving in time from left to right here. So going back in time 800 million years ago, we would find the common ancestor of all plants, the green algae. Then we would find the first land plants. Okay, so this would be our first land plants evolving 475 million years ago and something very similar to modern day mosses, okay, is what those would have looked like. Very short plants that look a lot like green algae but live on land. Okay, so then vascular tissue evolves and then seeds. So notice that all of these seedless vascular plants are called seedless because they do not produce seeds. So gymnosperms are the first group to produce seeds. And with that, by the way, goes pollen. Is that pollen there? So seeds and pollen. Okay, so gymnosperms have seeds and pollen. Do angiosperms have seeds and pollen? Yes, they do, because angiosperms evolve to the right of this dot, okay, this evolutionary event. Remember, we talk about these little dots on phylogenetic trees as evolutionary events, significant events, significant adaptations. And we see these adaptations in all the organisms moving forward as we move forward to the right, okay? So we go to the right in time towards present day. So then the evolutionary event of flowers and fruits evolve, and now we get the angiosperms. So do gymnosperms have flowers and fruits? No, they do not, because we see that there's a common ancestor that gymnosperms and angiosperms shared that produced seeds and pollens, but then the tree branches, and we get all these different groups of gymnosperms, but then we get another branch, a cousin, okay, of the gymnosperms that branches here and develops a new trait, evolves a new trait, flowers and sometimes fruits. Okay, so let's talk about some of the adaptations that plants have. So like I said, roots are a very important trait or something root-like because this is going to allow land plants to survive on land. Remember, their ancestors lived in the water. So then these plants move on to land. Well, if you're going to live on land, you're going to need some sort of system that can go deep down into the soil and seek out water and absorb that water and minerals. And that's what roots allow plants to do. So roots are an adaptation that plants have. Leaves. So when we look at leaves, there's really three important things to think about. One is that leaves have small pores that we call stomata, and this allows for gas exchange. So remember, plants are going to take in carbon dioxide for photosynthesis, and they're going to release oxygen through their stomata. 
Some plants, not all, but some plants evolve vascular tissue. Vascular tissue is important for transport of water up through the plant so the plant can grow taller. It also provides support for the plant so that it can grow a, a structure similar to our own skeletons that allow it to sit upright. And then lastly, leaves have something called a cuticle. Usually there's a waxy substance on the surface of the cuticle, and that is to trap water inside the leaf and prevent water loss because photosynthesis requires water. So we don't want to have these plants losing their water and dehydrating and not being able to perform photosynthesis. Some plants produce flowers, remember? So flowers produce pollen and egg cells, and we'll learn about them in the angiosperm lecture. The importance of pollen, well, pollen is actually a way that plants deliver sperm. Remember, all plants reproduce sexually, producing egg and sperm. Now, some plants have pollen as a way to help move that, that sperm longer distances. And it's a big evolutionary adaptation that will allow for better survival in the environment. Some plants make fruits. The purpose of fruit is to protect and disperse seeds. And the protect, a purpose of seeds, the seed contains the embryo and also provides the food source for the embryo. So there's a little baby plant inside of seeds. But remember, not all plants have seeds. So basically on the right side of the screen, we're looking at traits that all plants have. And then on the left of the screen, pollen, flowers, seeds, and fruits, our plants are only certain plants have those traits, only gymnosperms or angiosperms. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about the life cycle of plants. But before we do that, let's talk about the life cycle of animals because this is a life cycle that we can relate to because we are animals and we understand this. So we've talked about it this semester as well. So we're gonna use this as a comparison to help you see some similarities with plant sexual life cycles and animal sexual life cycles but also help you see where the differences are. So in us, or in animals, like these frogs on the screen, many animals have two uh, unique um, members of the species, meaning there's a separate male and there's a separate female. That's not always the case in animals, but many sexually reproducing animals, there is a male and there is a female, the adults. And those adults are diploid. So remember diploid, we use that symbol 2N, like you see on the slide here. So these adults are diploid. Now you can see there's a little bit of a color coding going on here. So diploid is going to be color coded um, green. So we know the adults are diploid, meaning that they have two copies of each chromosome. We studied in this class the process that adults use, so the cell division process that adults use to produce their gamete cells. Do you remember what that process is called? That's right, meiosis. So both females and males undergo meiosis to produce their gamete cells. What are gamete cells? Egg cells and sperm cells. So let's go with yellow to highlight haploid in this diagram. So as a product of meiosis, the females will make haploid egg cells and the males will produce haploid sperm cells. So then the egg cells and the sperm cells 
combine in a process we call fertilization. Now, the, in animals, fertilization can occur inside of the female's body or it can occur outside of the female's body. In other words, the female will lay unfertilized eggs and then sperm will fertilize those eggs. And that's actually the case in frogs. As a result of fertilization, when the egg and the sperm combine their genetic information, we get a zygote. Okay, so a zygote is another word for a fertilized egg. It contains both sets of chromosomes, and we're going to highlight it green because the zygote is 2N. It's diploid. Okay, as a result of fertilization, we get a zygote, and the zygote will grow by mitosis. So mitosis will create identical cells of the zygote and form a juvenile frog. Eventually, that juvenile frog, that tadpole, will continue mitosis into adulthood, forming the adult animals. So that process should be very familiar to you because it's pretty similar to how it works in humans. So now let's look at how it works in plants because there are some big differences that are just a little bit weird, okay? So just get ready for that. So this is the sexual life cycle of plants. All plants perform this, these five stages that you see outlined here. Now I haven't put in the words because we're gonna do that together. Okay, so we're gonna follow this cycle in stages. So we're gonna start with where you see the number one and number one is going to stand for gametophyte. Like I said, get ready for some really different words that we're not used to. Okay, so gametophyte is a very important term. Gametophyte literally means gamete plant. Although I like to add one more word to it when I'm teaching this to students, and I like to refer to gametophyte as the gamete producing plant. So it's a gamete producing plant. So if you add that word producing in there, that's really important. <laughs> then you can remember, oh yeah, what does the gametophyte make? Oh, gametes, okay. So something you should also know about the gametophyte. So all plants have some structure that they use to produce their gametes. It's their reproductive organ. We call it the gametophyte, okay. And so the gametophyte is always going to be multicellular. And the gametophyte is also always going to be haploid, genetically haploid, having half the chromosome number of the plant. So that's where there is a big difference here between, between animals and plants. Because in animals, our reproductive organs, now in animals, our reproductive organs are our ovaries and our testes, okay, males versus, or females versus males there. And those are always gonna be diploid because they're part of our, our bodies. So the fact that the plants have a haploid reproductive organ is very different here. So the gametophyte part. Now that gametophyte might be housed inside of a diploid tissue, but the gametophyte itself will always be haploid. Now here's the other difference. We talked about in, in animals, that animals, when they make their gamete cells, make their gamete cells by meiosis. That is not how it works in plants. The gametophyte, the gamete producing plant, makes the gamete cells 
by mitosis. See that? So it's not meiosis, it's mitosis that plants use to make their gamete cells. And that's step two here. So step two, these cells here are gametes. This in particular is the egg, and this would be a sperm cell. Let's also add that symbol that we use when we're talking about haploid, which is just a lowercase n. So the gametophyte is n or haploid. The gametes are n or haploid. Okay, so haploid, haploid. Okay, sexual reproduction. We use that word sexual reproduction whenever you're talking about an egg cell that combines with a sperm cell. So we have an egg cell and a sperm cell that combine. And we call that process fertilization. Now that is the same in animals. So notice over here, we have an egg cell and we have a sperm cell and they combine, we get fertilization. So that process is the same in plants. So we call that process fertilization. And then once again, back over here, to the animals after fertilization, what do we call it? We call this, this fertilized egg a zygote. We use that same term in plants. So three, this would be a zygote. Is the zygote haploid or diploid? Well, the zygote is a combination of chromosomes from the egg and the sperm, isn't it? two sets of chromosomes, a set from the egg and a set from the sperm. Therefore, the zygote is diploid, just like it is in animals. And just like in animals, the zygote will divide by the cell division process we call mitosis to form identical cells, identical diploid cells. In other words, become multicellular. So plants do become multicellular diploid, but they do so and their mature form, okay, their, their mature adult form is called a sporophyte. Let's put another box around that one. That's another really important term to understand in a plant life cycle. So they're mature form, their mature diploid form is called a sporophyte. So what does sporophyte mean? Well, it literally means spore plant, but let's add the word producing there. So we're gonna call this the spore producing plant. So it's the, it's the plant that's gonna produce Spores, okay, so spores are part of, part of the life cycle of plants, all plants. And the sporophyte is multicellular diploid. So it's the multicellular diploid form of the plant, 2N. Okay, so here's where it gets different from animals. There are no animals that make spores, okay? Who makes spores that we've talked about? Fungi, right? So fungi, members of the kingdom fungi, make spores. Molds, okay, and mushrooms. Now certain bacteria also make spores, but we didn't go into the details about that when we talked about bacteria. Okay, now you're learning that plants also make spores. All plants, every single plant. So this is a, gen once again, this is a generalized life cycle that all of our plants do. All of our plants do this. And we're gonna be studying some of the differences in the way these structures appear, their look, how they look, but they all perform this process. So sporophyte, spore producing plant. 
look though, how does it make its spores? Meiosis. So meiosis is part of the life cycle of plants. However, it's not in the production of gamete cells. That is weird, I know, because we're used to animals over here. We're used to meiosis being over here. In animals, this is how I taught you we make our sperm and our egg cells as animals. So now look, that's not how it works in the plants. The plants use meiosis to create their spores. So this is how they generate some diversity because remember there's two important things you need to know about meiosis. One, meiosis transforms diploid cells into haploid cells. So we go uh, diploid to haploid as a result of meiosis. The second important thing you need to remember about meiosis, this creates genetic diversity in the cells, the haploid cells. In animals, that's how our egg cells and our sperm cells become genetically diverse. In plants, they use meiosis to produce genetically diverse spores. So let's label number five as spores. And will the spores be haploid or diploid? Okay, if the sporophyte is diploid, meiosis always goes diploid to haploid. Spores are haploid. And they're genetically unique because that is how meiosis works. Meiosis creates genetically unique cells that are haploid. Okay, so once again, let's, let's color code this by haploid and diploid. Let's do this, let's make a line here. So everything on the top here would be diploid. Remember 2N means diploid. And N means haploid. Okay, let's take out our highlighters. We're going to do green is diploid. So everything we highlight in green is diploid. So what's diploid? The zygote and the sporophyte structure, the sporophyte plant. Let's take out our yellow highlighter. Everything that is highlighted in yellow is haploid. So the gametophyte is haploid. The gamete cells that are produced from the gametophyte, the egg cells and the sperm cells. and the spores that are produced from the sporophyte. Now notice here the spores will grow into the gametophyte. That's the final part of the cycle. So these haploid spores grow by mitosis. Remember anytime we talk about growth going from single-celled to multicellular because spores are single-celled. These are single-celled spores but they're gonna, a single spore is going to divide by mitosis, that growth process, to create a multicellular gametophyte that is genetically identical to that spore. And then that spore is going to create gametes, I'm sorry, that gametophyte is gonna produce gametes, and there will be separate parts of the gametophyte that make the egg cells and separate parts of the gametophyte that make the sperm cells. Fertilization occurs, we get a zygote. The zygote grows by mitosis because the zygote is single-celled. The single-celled zygote divides by mitosis to form a multicellular sporophyte that is also diploid and the cycle repeats. Please make sure you now look at your study guide for lecture 18, and I have a fill in the blank question 
please fill in the blanks on that question to test your understanding of the stages of this sexual reproductive cycle we call alternation of generations because it's very important you understand the general life cycle here before we go into the specific plant group. So we'll use this as a framework to build on to help you understand the life cycles of the four major plant groups. Okay, so answer those study guide questions before you proceed to the next lecture video. And we'll talk to you in the next video.